Okay, so we are here uh, again, another week of Unapologetically Black Unicorns, and I am so fortunate to have a wonderful, fantastic, fantabulous, just amazing guest, somebody who I've gotten to know over, I guess, the past couple of years, who's doing amazing work in mental health policy, and that is Laura Evans. So, Laura, as you know, I don't do bios. Do you mind introducing yourself to our listeners? Yes. Well, thank you, Karis. And thank you for having me on. I'm also having the privilege of having a conversation with you, who are all of the amazing things, uh, all of the adjectives I would put right back onto you. Um, So thank you for having me on the podcast. I am Laura Evans. I consider myself a strategic communicator uh, who's passionate about helping people advocate for public policy change. Okay. Wow. So that is what we're going to talk about today. You know, and and the reason that I wanted to have this conversation is a lot of times in the behavioral health field. So I'll, I'll say behavioral health broadly, both mental health and substance use disorders or, or addiction that I don't really see a lot of black and brown folks, you know, leading in the policy space. And So I'm always interested, like I fell into doing policy work. Maybe I was dragged into it. Maybe I was pushed (laughs) into it. I'm really not quite sure. But at the end of the day, it wasn't something that was on my radar as something that one could do as far as a career, uh, especially in mental health. When we think about mental health change, we think of activists and advocates, but policy is also a big lever to make change. So how did you get interested in policy work? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I I like the way that you frame that because oftentimes, particularly those of us uh, who are people of color, black and brown people, we are forced into this, right? Because the role of government has had such an impact in our lives, on our ancestors, on why things are how they are today. I've always been interested in that uh, from when I was a young girl interested in why are some schools funded well and other schools not funded well? And why is that? Uh, And oftentimes, particularly now as we talk about social determinants of health, there is a clear hand of government and a clear role of government in setting out those priorities in determining what those outcomes are and a role in our everyday lives. Uh, What am I allowed to do? What is my trajectory? I've always been interested in that. And so I just knew that I had to get involved in some way uh, in this field to help make it more equitable. Mm -hmm. And I I will also say this is um, probably a tangent, but I am the third of six. And so I was always interested in in what's fair, uh, probably because I felt like I wasn't getting my fair share. I love that. (laughs) I was the third of six and I had to like fight for everything. Um, I'm I'm one of two. um, So uh, that's really kind of interesting that 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 also had like played a role in sort of how you thought about what you would what you would be doing. And, you know, I was thinking about also when I sort of was introduced to to policy work. And again, it was sort of accidental on the accidental policy wonk person. (laughs) Um, And I found it super geeky. And I was like, oh my God, this is so geeky. Now I am a giant geek. I'm a blurred. People know I'm a black nerd. It's all cool. But at the same time, it was like, yeah, but this is so intriguing. It's kind of like hot. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that's appropriate yeah, to yeah. say. <laughs> but I mean, it's kind of like watching the world of intrigue when you get into policy work. So first of all, when you sort of saw this as like, you know, something that you kind of were interested in, especially around sort of equity issues and in fairness, what's the trajectory of like getting into this as a career field? So we'll start there. Sure. So my entry into this was probably more traditional in in that when I was an undergrad, I was a psychology undergrad major. And so I was really interested in anything related to mental health and brain health and how can we help people get well. And I didn't really necessarily, even though I was interested in public policy and the role of government, didn't see myself reflected as much in what does that look like, right? So growing up, we did have, you know, Shirley Chisholm and 
uh, Representative Tubbs, who was from Ohio, and I'm from Ohio originally. Mm-hmm. But but I sort of thought, well, okay, if I could just make a change for one person, maybe being a, a private practitioner or, or a clinician, then that was okay. Uh, but probably that 2006 election while I was in college, I'm sorry, 2004, uh, was when I really thought like, there, there's a way to combine psychology and public policy uh, and understanding why do people vote against their own interest and why people are elected that are seemingly at odds with what we say we want to do as a society. So from there, I added political science as a, a co-major for my undergrad degree. And from there, uh, lots of internships, lots of internships. At the time, most of them were unpaid. And I know there's been a movement to pay people for internships. And I do believe that's right, because that's another uh, barrier that exists and existed for me for a long time. And I think maybe for other people of color looking to get in this space, we absolutely cannot work for free. You yeah. know, it was very challenging to, you know, try to work and go to school and the work isn't paying you. Um, So I'm all about this movement to pay interns, but there's a lot of internships. And then from there and working on campaigns, uh, from there, I made it to the Ohio legislature working for a, a state representative who was phenomenal. Then I made the jump to DC and doing federal work and getting involved with nonprofits. But I think my pathway is a little more traditional, but there, you know, I think that traditional pathway, there's a lot of barriers for people of color. One of the things I encountered in the Ohio legislature was that, you know, it was very racially coded, right? So Mm. the representatives, the black representatives, because I don't think we had any Asian representatives at the time, you know, they had black staff and the white representatives and senators had white staff Mm. and you didn't really see anyone cross that line. Well, I'll say, to be clear, the Black senators, Black representatives sometimes did have white staff, Mm -hmm. but very rarely did you see the opposite happen. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it really competitive because there's only a few of us who are actually elected anyway, right? Like so many people of color who are actually elected to the state legislature, then you have all the people who are interested in those one or two jobs because there's only one or two black senators. And this is just my experience from Ohio. Um, well, you know, as you're saying that you're you're making me realize what I've seen when I visited the Hill, both in DC and in California, um, which is, you know, the primary places where um, I've had to do like legislative visits or testimony or something like that. You, you're really bringing up something that I, I guess I hadn't even really noticed about sort of the color coded and the color lines and things like that, that if I was walking in to see a, a legislator who was a Black, their whole office was Black. <laughs> All the staff were Black people. <laughs> yes. And, and I would go, and it would just be like, I'd walk in and I'd go, oh yeah, okay, hey bro, what's up? Like, you know, it was just kind of like, a, you could kind of be more like at home. And then I'd walk into somebody else's office and it'd be like this completely different vibe. And I, I never really kind of noticed at the time, I mean, I guess I noticed, but I didn't take note. Maybe that's what I was doing. But as you're bringing it up, it's like, yeah, and that's still the same today. It's still the same today. Wow. Yeah. That really says something. And you know what else I was thinking as you were talking is, how do people even know that these opportunities are even available. I mean, I'm thinking back when I was in high school and we took like history or civics or whatever these courses were called back then. Makes it sound like I'm like back in the stagecoach days. I am not. However, you know, nobody ever, at least to my recollection, and and I went to, you know, a top high school in, in the DC area, which is kind of interesting, you know, talked about, you know, how do you get into working um, on the Hill or working for a legislative office or even working for like your board of supervisors? I don't remember that being something that was shared to kind of even get people interested in doing this kind of work. Yeah. I think your experience is probably in line with most people's experience, right? Like this just isn't shared. And part of what I see myself doing when I say I'm a strategic communicator is helping people realize that 
this thing that we don't talk about, right? You know, government relations, government affairs, advocacy, public policy, this informs nearly every aspect of your life, including where you could live, right? Because there were redlining policies, including whether someone with a serious mental illness can find meaningful work that pays above a certain amount, um, given the policies on social security disability insurance, whether you can attend college because the funding for uh, scholarships for, to public schools have been cut, whether you can start a business, right? Because the incentives for starting a business have changed. So I just see this as, I see the work that I do is letting people know the information mm-hmm. because it's not shared. And so the more the information is out there, the more there's awareness that government does have this role in you as a citizen have the responsibility to know what they're doing and what's going on. I see that as sort of my calling. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's amazing. And so glad you're doing the work. And, you know, when I've, you know, been in the the work work with you, I'll put it that way, the work work, because we don't work in the same place, but we may be on similar on calls or things like that together. And kind of, I can hear your brilliance. And I love the, also the way that you can explain things such that, I mean, I've worked with some policy folk and they're explaining things and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like what what did they say <laughs> like i don't even understand that's not english of course it is english but sometimes i think that's the other reason why people have a hard time engaging and especially legislative work is like reading a bill is like okay that's my bedtime reading i can get maybe <laughs> like two sentences <laughs> or so and i'm like okay i'm asleep you have to really pay attention and um you know it's the there as and the what fors and the shalls and the you know those kind of things that really can be a bit dry so um but for people who can translate that sort of for the lay public i think is also a tremendous skill so is that part of your strategic communications training absolutely karis and thank you for those compliments. You know, it, it it can be very dry. And so I like to think of it as what are they? And the they being the the people in black, you know, the, the men in black from government. Uh, what are they trying to do that I need to know about that they don't want me to know about? Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Because it, it's sort of like Vegas, right? The house is always going to win. So I need to know what the odds are, where the lines are, so I can try to get the best outcome for my community, for society writ large, and, and particularly in the mental health space, right? Like I have people in my family who have been affected by serious mental illness. And so trying to also help them navigate the rules, the regulations, what they can do. And it just sort of came to me for some reason. I have I don't have a legal background. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but being able to translate that, I think, is an important skill of what does this actually mean for me? And what do I actually need to do? And in one sense, I'm not a unicorn because there are a lot of people like me, but how can we ensure that they are getting opportunities to be in this space, yep. whether it was the traditional pathway or like you said, the accidental advocate and let them know that government represents us too, and they need to hear from us and, and yeah. be attuned into our needs. Yeah, that is that is really so powerful. Thumbs up, claps, all the nine <laughs> yards around sort of, I'm, I'm with you on all of that. And, you know, thinking back when you said like, you know, what is it the men in black? What is it they really want that they're not telling you, right? That that's kind of what I'm trying to help people think about because, you know, I learned that the hard way in trying to get some legislation passed here um, in California. People know this story, so it's not like I'm saying anything um, secretive at all or letting out some kind of big secret. But, you know, we're trying to pass our our certified peer um, legislation to bill Medicaid or Medi-Cal as we call it here. And, you know, it first bill didn't go through the second bill went all the way through and then it was vetoed and then the third bill and it was you know it was like what is going on like 47 other states have this like why can we not have this what's happening everybody knew that there was some uh, like it wasn't a secret but everybody knew that there was this proposition called prop 30 that created a different funding structure when you put in a new uh, workforce in in medicaid as as a new benefit So if you put in this new benefit, 
a provider type as a new benefit, then Prop 30 kicks in, which means that the state has to pick up the share of cost. And well, the state didn't really want to pick up the share of cost. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they were like, we don't want to pick up our non-federal share of cost. So, so we didn't know that. And that's why the bill kept being vetoed. Everybody else knew it, but the peers actually didn't know it. And I was just getting so frustrated. I said, why is this thing being vetoed? Well, they think it's expensive. And I'm like, okay, but wait, it's it's a share of costs and it's, you know, 50, 50, 45, whatever. So finally somebody said, like whispered in my ear, it's Prop 30. And I'm like, what's Prop 30? <laughs> it's like this big secret. And so when they told me what it was, I was like, okay, wait, that's what's been standing in the way. We've been, we were fighting all sorts of other things. We were like, it's almost like we had a hammer and we were like, everything was a nail and it wasn't a nail. It was, it was something completely different and we needed a completely different um, tool. And and so the workaround for Prop 30 is you do it as county opt-in by not making it a Medicaid mandate, but um, the counties opt in into it and then the cost shifts to the counties. Now, the counties weren't too happy with that, but at the end of the day, the counties were already paying the full freight for peer support. So being able to do it as county opt-in and get a federal share made it a little bit more attractive. But how do we know that? Like, that's right. what I someone really, hadn't told you. Someone hadn't whispered in your ear. <laughs> whispered in my like you have the nerve to whisper. You should be shouting that from the mountaintops like three years ago. But <laughs> I mean, I think what what it taught me was like, how do you continue to ask questions? How do you find out really what's the real deal? And then get that communicated to you in a way that is understood so that you can help advocate to change whatever it is that happens to be in the way. So, you know, I really appreciate you talking about the people in the in the in the black suits who are making decisions but not always upfront about what that decision is all about or what that thing is that they really want. You have to really work to answer that question. Well, and that's the the, the strategic component, right? Mm-hmm. Making sure that we are taking the re- requests and we're in the right forum. Is this state, federal, county? What's the jurisdiction? Who do we need to talk to? How do we need to frame this in a way that they also understand that what they're hoping to achieve would be accomplished by adding peers? There's so much need. I and mean, I don't know all the details of your example, but there's just so much need in the mental health space. Uh, in so many spaces that, you know, just making sure that we are framing it of, you know, what you're trying to accomplish, people getting help or people having the freedom of choice is also the same thing we want to accomplish, that they now have this new provider type, that there are options uh, and that there is now people to help with this need (laughs) that is so clear. So, you know, I think it, it is public policy just really encompasses all of that being strategic, the public relations and relationship building, the actual technical knowledge of what are we trying to change and how can we accomplish that? A little bit of legal of the, you know, legislative drafting and how can we write this in a way that allows or incentivize people to opt in or, or, you know, have that change occur. Yeah. And then where do we push, right? What are the levers that we need to push and let them know we're not going to back down? Exactly. I mean, it was so interesting because, you know, we thought that the state didn't want peers. That's what we thought, because it was like, you're vetoing this, like, and we kept thinking, because, you know, it's such a battle to get peers sort of in place, that that's what we thought what was going on. It was like, yep, nope, that was the nail. And we're using a hammer. And this is not a nail. And we needed a completely different, like strategy. So what what I did, actually, and, and this is, you know, why I also wanted to have this conversation with you is that, I wanted other people to kind of get involved in being able to be policy activists. So you're an activist, but how are you also a policy activist, if that's even a word? And so I created this group called the Policy Wonkers because I wanted people to see policy as, quite frankly, sexy. Um, (laughs) And that if if we're a group and we got a name and maybe Policy Wonkers wasn't the right name to make it as sexy as possible, however... It ended up with a you know a you know a handful or more of of peers kind of saying yeah this is kind of like solving a puzzle and I like puzzles and I also want to get excited about um, being able to figure out the lever to actually um, 
impact that policy change that we want to see. So it's kind of exciting. And I mean, do you find policy work intriguing, exciting, sexy? And how do you how do you also help other people get into this field? Have you have you done that? I I find it so fascinating. I love that you said solving a puzzle because that's sometimes how I see it or you know being a detective or trying to figure out how can I how can I accomplish this? How can I get this done? And so much of politics, which I see as being separate from policy, is gamemanship and understanding what's the political landscape, who is holding power, what are their values, what are they interested in? Um, so I definitely see that as, um, for me, one way to keep it fun and exciting and, and sexy of how can I convince this person that what I believe to be needed, you know, whether it's peer inclusion or increased reimbursement or funding for 988, how can I help get this goal over the finish line? So I find it so fascinating, so fun, because it's, it's, you have to change your pitch every time, uh, depending on your audience. Yes. Yes. Um, I tell people, you know, my, my upbringing as a quote unquote army brat or global nomad sort of helped me be able to shift um, how I have conversations when I'm um, in different groups and with different people to make sure that, um, you know, I'm hearing what they're saying, they can hear what I'm saying. So, so it is sort of, you know, I would have, I love the word strategic communication because I think that's what I'm doing, but that's not the terminology that I've ever used about it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's uh, also what I'm, I'm doing in it. You know, it, it's a, it's a skill. Um, and I think one that can really help um, activists in the field and advocates in the field. When um, you're doing your work at at Vibrant, so we, you know we've had Dr. John Draper on previously when um, he was working at at Vibrant, sort of leading up the 988 work. But Vibrant is a little bit more than just 988. <laughs> That's a lot of Vibrant. But so what <laughs> other what other things do you, do you work on at at Vibrant? Sure. And I don't think I shared this at the beginning, but I am currently the Director of Public Policy and Government Affairs at Vibrant Emotional Health. Vibrant Emotional Health, we are a nonprofit that has been around for over 50 years, providing direct services in the New York City area, but also you most likely know us from 988 uh, and the Disaster Distress Helpline and some other national uh, services that we provide. Vibrant is working on, in the public policy space, a number of issues um, outside of 988. One near and dear to my heart, since I live in Florida these days, is climate justice and how do parts of the climate uh, and climate change and, again, you know, where are factories located, how that has an impact on individuals' mental health. We also see that when we talk about equity. And that poor communities are often in areas where there is more air pollution and how that affects their physical health and in in turn their mental health. Living in disaster areas, I'm in Florida and just each hurricane season seems to be getting worse. So that's one of the the big issues we've weighed in um, with some of the, the federal agencies on how they can embed climate justice in some of their work. Of course, equity and belonging is a uh, key component of Vibrant's values. Wow. Wow. So first of all, I'm really glad to hear about the intersection of climate justice and, and mental health, like double down on that. I couldn't agree more. I think a lot of times people struggle with seeing that interconnectedness and and think, oh, well, that's for, you know, quote unquote, the walking well. And it's like, yeah, you're walking well until... And then you ain't yeah. walking well, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so the idea is we, we want people to be well. So we have to think about climate and climate justice issues to ensure people have whole health and wellness, which includes their mental health. So, so glad that, that you all are, are working on that and also have weighed in on that. And of course, um, equity, inclusion, belonging. We can we can go on and on and on about the disparities related to, you know, particularly communities of color, rural communities, LGBTQ you know, youth, just so much. And so, um, you know, glad you all are doing this work and that, you know, you're there sort of pushing those policy levers to impact communities that are in most need. So, you know, bow down before you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop. 
<laughs> hey, well, and and vibrant too. I mean, you know, you know, just just glad that we have this type of work happening out there in the field. And sometimes we don't know what we don't know. So it's nice to talk a little bit about it so that the listeners can hear that, you know, yes, there's NAMI and MHA. Those are known. Vibrant, of course, is known for 988, I think, but possibly not for all the other things that you just talked about. So that's amazing. Yeah. Well, and really looking at the social determinants of health. And and one of the things that Vibrant is really trying to do is making sure that we're sharing our platform um, you know, making sure that the organizations that have been working at this much longer than we have, or are, you know, real true subject matter experts, that we're sharing our platform so that they have space to talk about the work and the lessons learned and, and things that we can share across communities. I'm not a clinician, um, <laughs> right? Uh, so it's just really fascinating to see all of this work. And for me to just be able to amplify that when we talk about, okay, government, uh, this is what's happening, right? Like, yeah. and, and here is the impact, right, on your constituents. Um, mm-hmm. and, and here's how we can change that. So, you know, I think sometimes we, we being the folks in the mental health space, talk about systemic change and, and, and kind of those big things. Um, and I want to make sure that we're saying that we're also bringing government into that to say, you have a role here because your policies are either incentivizing these things to occur mm-hmm. or intentionally wanted them to occur. And we need to correct that. Right, right. Snaps, claps, thumbs up again. Um, <laughs> so, you know, as we kind of wrap up, because we're going to wrap up in a second, um, I always ask our listeners, our listeners, I always ask our listeners to listen to the people who are talking. That's what I ask the listeners to do. Um, But what I ask our guests to do is to do a bit of wisdom dropping. And that's just an opportunity for you to provide some wisdom, which you've been doing through this whole conversation. But this is a special time to add anything special that you would like our listeners to know or leave them with. Sure. Most immediately, what comes to mind is a quote from former Ohio State Senator Ray Miller, Um, And I think he may be the originator of this, but if not, he sold me on it. But it was, if you're not at the table, then you're on the table. And that for me just really struck that, um, you know, if we are not and we being any part of our identities, right? So as, as a peer or a person has a lived experience or, you know, your gender identity, your racial identity, you know, whatever it may be. But if if that isn't represented, more than likely that is being legislated some way, most likely restrictive. So it's really imperative uh, for folks to get involved, whether it is at the federal level, calling your congressperson, uh, or even down to your local board of supervisors, your school board, making sure that you're aware of what's occurring in your community, how that impacts your life, what you want to do, just get involved and and find the people who will whisper in your ear and tell you what's actually happening. I think that's so important. So being at the table so that you're not on the table and perhaps even expanding that to, you know, if they're not giving you a seat at the table, build your own. (laughs) Build your own, Uh, that's right. (laughs) Yes. Uh, they, They won't be able to ignore you. Yep. Yep. Love it. Love it. So Laura, thank you so, so much for spending some time with me on Unapologetically Black Unicorns. It's been an exquisite conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I love it. So um, for our listeners, y'all know what the the, uh, podcast producer says that comes out of my mouth, which is like, comment, subscribe, which I say, okay, is all fine. But the most important thing to do is to share the podcast with others. There are going to be people who will benefit from the information or have interest in the information. So please do share the podcast with others so that they can listen in. And until next week, we will see you on Unapologetically Black Unicorns. <laughs>